it's a good opportunity as well to practice our English. And, um, and we are going to finish the, the conference with a Colombian lady. So, um, and in the middle, we, we are going to have technology for life related to sports and to accessibility to the web and, and whatever. But uh, let's start with uh, Susanna. That is, uh, in, in some some way, uh, I think, uh, in, in, from in the in the work point of view or field, we have uh, some. I, I'm proud to be a, to have a parallel life with her because, uh, as uh, we we have been working, as Christina told us yesterday, we have been working for 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 many years in the standardization. That is probably. A boring thing to do, but uh, but a very useful thing to to do. It's necessary. Standards are completely necessary. My my mentor in this was uh, probably uh, Timothy Berners Lee, that was a, an enthusiastic person in the standardization of things. That is why the web exists, probably. And uh, she has been working on on this sector, on this field, from from from. Uh, his uh, her post as a CEO of uh, Funka, but working on on on, on very on, on many aspects of accessibility standardization, she is very expert on on um, uh, blind person devices uh, uh, accessibility for many kinds of people, and um, I've had some conference of her, and I always got the impression that I have a lot of things to learn, still lots of things to learn. So, Susana, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming and uh, to Spain, and I hope to you, you enjoy the, your staying here, and the people will enjoy your, your speak, for, for sure. Thank you. Ok, gracias por invitarme a esta conferencia. Voy a intentar hablar un poco en español, eh, pero <ríe> eh, el, la mayoría en inglés. <ríe> Me llamo Susana Laurin y trabajo desde hace 12 años en una empresa sueco que se llama Funka. Y eh, eh, antes de Funka he trabajado en el ámbito de personas con discapacidad durante muchos años. Por ejemplo, como jefa de una empresa propiedad de la Organización Nacional de Discapacitados Visual y Ciegos, como ONCE en España. <coughs> y eh, Funka... Eh, sí, Funka... <ríe> ha comenzado como, una, eh, como un proyecto no gubernamental en los años 90, con dinero de una fundación. Todas las organizaciones de personas con discapacidad se han reunido para construir un sitio web eh, para discapacitados hecho por discapacitados. Hay normas internacionales, pero esta es la primera vez que alguien ha intentado hacer eso en todo el mundo. Y el contenido del sitio web es de cultura, bienestar social, deporte, tecnología, tecnología de apoyo, etc. El sitio web eh, ha sido un gran éxito y ha tenido muchos visitantes de toda Escandinavia. Eh, <coughs> eh, eh, cuando el proyecto ha terminado, la tecnología y los empleados se han adquirido y una empresa con oficina en Estocolmo, Suecia, eh, se ha creado. Y después hemos, hemos eh, vendido servicios de consultoría en accesibilidad. En 2010 hemos abierto una oficina en Oslo, Noruega y en 2013 aquí en Madrid. Y por eso yo voy a hablar español. Uf, es muy difícil para mí. Uh, 
Y Funca, nosotros eh, trabajamos con todo lo que otras empresas en accesibilidad hacen. Eh, es como eh, requisitos, auditorías, eh, pruebas de usuarios y formación. Pero a diferencia de otras, eh, desarrollamos también a sitios web. Eh, eso es muy importante porque significa que no solamente podemos encontrar los problemas, sino también presentar las soluciones. A causa de nuestro origen, eh, tenemos un, una posición especial. Eh, trabajamos, hacemos trabajos muy estratégicos para la, eh, para la, para la Comisión Europea y para los gobiernos nacionales en Holanda, Irlanda, Noruega, Suecia, etc. Y como todo lo que nos, nosotros eh, recomendamos está probado en la vida real, eh, trabajos también eh, mucho con eh, investigación, a menudo eh, juntos con las universidades. Tenemos un doctorando industrial en la Universidad eh, Técnica Real en Estocolmo y esperamos que sea el primer profesor especializado de, en eh, accesibilidad eh, cognitiva en el mundo. Eh, por nosotros es muy importante seguir teniendo una buena y cercana relación con las organizaciones de personas con discapacidad y por eso hacemos regularmente proyectos juntos con ellos. Eh, de esta forma eh, aprendamos, aprendemos, aprendamos, ¿no? eh, <ríe> eh, 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 directamente de, del grupo del usuario final y somos también muy activos en el desarrollo de normas en España con AENOR, en Suecia, en Noruega también y en nivel europeo. De esta manera podemos ayudar a difundir el conocimiento de las soluciones accesibles en el mundo. Y para elevar el nivel, de profesional, eh, el nivel profesional de la gente que trabaja con accesibilidad en el mundo, hemos fundado una organización internacional para expertos en accesibilidad, juntos con otras empresas pequeñas como Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, etc. Eh, y Funka. Eh, muy pequeño eh, 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 y la, el nombre de la organización es IAAP es International Association of Accessibility Professionals es Asociación Internacional de Profesionales en Accesibilidad o algo eh, lo siento pero mi español no es tan rápido que, eh, como debiera y por eso voy a, a eh, eh, hacer el resto de mi presentación en inglés. Pero gracias por escucharme. So, <coughs> accessibility um, has to do, of course, with every one of us. I don't need to tell that to you because I think this, this audience already knows this. But um, to us, it's really something that affects all of us and in throughout all our lives. We need to dedicate our business to the built environment and to ICT and to different parts, but really accessibility goes for everything. And in ICT nowadays, it is extremely complicated um, because we have so many different devices and so many different techniques. So I think that every one of us feels sometimes a little bit disabled. Um, <clears throat> but I was uh, introduced here or, or invited here to, to talk about ICT and accessibility and the social part of it uh, from a little bit uh, a different angle. So I would like to start with, with some sort of overview of from the product point of view. So when a product is born or a product is, is made, uh, of course you need to take a lot of things in mind. You have to 
discuss the market and a lot of things. But usually uh, you look into, for example, user needs and you try to find the hip factor. You need to find something that is really looks sexy so that people will want to have it, good design. It should be maybe a new idea or at least a, a better idea than your competitors have. And, uh, and also, of course, if you are in the ICT area, you would like something that is, has to do with the latest technique. And probably you uh, can find something that the customers also really can afford to, to pay for. Uh, or they want it so much that it's not, the price is not a problem. And then, of course, there's a lot of marketing and communication going on. And, of course, this list could be much longer, but at least these are some things that, from a business perspective, is always important when you try to create a new product. But try to Google wheelchair, and this is what you get. You get 50 shades of grey. Assistive technology, during my whole life, has been looking like something very boring. It looks from something from the from the eastern parts of, of the old behind the Iron Curtain before in the Soviet Union, and it really puts people to sleep. It's a little bit like standardization, which is we say when we work with standards, you say that it's a sure way to lose friends and put family asleep. <laughs> That's the definition of standardization. Yeah. Yeah. So, regulations are boring. Accessibility always has to do with laws and regulations. And nobody gets out of bed in the morning, or very few people gets out of bed in the morning to say, yeah, I'm not going to break the law today. I mean, that's not an incentive. That's boring. And um, you sort of risk to, to, to skip all creativity if you choose to just look at regulations parts of life. And we really don't do that. We never talk about regulations. We have very limited law, le legislation in the Scandinavian countries uh, about this. And people usually work with accessibility because they want to. It's, we say that's why I say this is a part of quality. So it needs to be very good. And when I got into ICT, I'm not an ICT person from the start. I started from working from user perspective and talk, uh, working with people with disabilities and one day there came a revolution and that was when the computers went, were so good and the assistive technology made it possible for people with disabilities to really uh, work and be educated and, and um, be part of, of society in a new way. And I never thought that I could uh, live long enough to be, be part of another revolution. But a couple of years ago it really happened, the smartphone revolution. So, Apple, I'm sorry to be marketing, and <laughs> but, but they really showed the way. Uh, something has happened that is very new to, to this part. And really, we take uh, the internet with us everywhere. And I personally, I'm not very sure that that's a good thing, because I think we sometimes lose the, the human interaction. And we see people just looking and staring at their phones instead of communicating with other people around them. So there could be negative things. But from the disability point of view and from the assistive technology point of view, this is a fantastic thing. I think really it is a revolution. And it's mostly for, for three reasons. The mainstreaming idea. I mean, this is with the smartphones, um, the market really showed that you can put in assistive technology and lot, lots of good solutions that are good for everyone and especially very good for some people with disabilities, not everyone, but for some, uh, and also make it to a mainstream project because the smartphone is something that everyone wants. It's not cheap, but it's something that really people are queuing for and they want it and it looks, it looks good, it's a well-designed thing and everybody wants it. So it also gives people with disabilities a freedom, the ones that can use the smartphones, uh, that they don't need to queue up in line to ask the government or, or somebody else in an institution to have assistive technology. At least in Scandinavia, uh, everyone that needs assistive technology do get it. So it's not a problem of, of supply, but it doesn't feel good to go somewhere and ask for it. And I need to be assessed all the time. And then many individuals think that it's a bad feeling to ask and to be concentrating on my problems. 
I don't, don't want to talk about my problems, but I need to do that. And then somebody sort of gets me a stamp in my forehead where it says I'm an idiot and I need something extra. And that's very stigmatizing. And also for small children that need assistive technology in the classroom, they don't want to have something boring and ugly and gray, and they, they don't want to be different. They want to be like everyone else. So really being able to use the mainstream technology and solve some of, not all, but some of the assistive technology uh, problems, that is extremely good and extremely useful for many users. It also, it's, it's, it's really the freedom of not having to show that you, I need the assistive technology. I'm just, a, you know, I'm part of the inclusive society. And also I think the, the smartphone revolution is part of a democratic revolution because with the smartphone and the way we use internet these days, we are all disabled. I mean, any one of you have tried to, you know, send an email on the bus or when you're driving, don't do that, but really everyone is trying and I, I don't have very large hands, but my fingers are too big for my screen. It's fantastic, but it is like that. And, and some things are extremely difficult to, to handle. So, and when you use all your screens outdoors with the sunshine, at least in, in Spain, where you have sun sometimes, uh, <laughs> then you get the, the, the problems with the contrasts that we have always been talking about, good, the, the importance of good contrasts in, in ICT, but now it is for everyone because we use the technology in a new way. So this way it really, it takes some of the very specific uh, accessibility problems or objects if you want and put it into mainstream, which means that all of us are equally disabled and the solutions are also becoming mainstream. So now even the hip designer uh, companies, they want to do things that are responsive and responsive is just another word for accessible in terms of zooming. I mean, we always try to make things bigger so it should be flexible and now it needs to be smaller and it's the same technique. So that's very happy. So that's why we really said hallelujah. This is the hallelujah moment of the accessibility world when the smartphone revolution came. And I think you can learn something about product management and inclusiveness and the way of doing mainstreaming. And of course, for everyone that is involved in uh, produ producing assistive technology, this is changing the world. And in five years, the market will look completely different, I'm sure. And there are happening very many interesting things. And many of the screen reader and um, uh, enlargement, uh, the zooming, uh, technology, the companies that are making them, they are now into doing things that are more included in the websites instead. So the market is completely changing and I think generally that is for good. So if you don't believe in this, uh, some people say that we need to have legislation and we cannot just talk about positive things and so on and that is true and it's absolutely true for the, from the organization point of view. All, all end user organizations, at least where I come from, think that legislation is, is extremely important and it is. It is an important way of show what kind of society we want to have. And it's, I mean, it's a question of human rights, definitely. So the legislation is important and we need to be uh, talk about, talking about this and really ensuring that everyone gets the, the equal uh, rights and possibilities and so on. But really to move the market forward, we need to do something else as well. The legislation can never sort of solve the problems or, or doing innovation and creative things. So what we have some um, real time examples from, from, uh, from benefits is of course um, the quality work of doing, uh, of doing accessibility work. If you do follow the standards, you don't need to test very much and you know that if you are in an argument with your supplier, you can just choose another supplier and they will deliver in the same way. So it is a quality issue and also all design aspects of accessibility to make it pedagogically interesting so that you understand what items belong to what and where, where am I supposed to click, what, what's the link here and what is not. Everything that has to do with the design part of accessibility <coughs> is also a question of quality because if you do have the same design in, in <coughs> consequence, it also makes um, every object or every service or whatever it is more, more professional. And uh, working with accessibility also makes that, uh, means that some of the uh, problems with, with the changing technology is also less evident. Uh, I can't um, prove that it's always 
completely future-proof, but ex at least you work in a standardized way and you know that most of the technology you use is uh, also going to, to keep up with standards and so on for a longer time. And of course, if the clients or the customer thinks that this work website or this e-service or whatever it is really works and they don't have to to think very much they just believes that it is working so they will be happy nobody really sees accessibility when it's there but when it's unaccessible then you really notice so if it just it's, if it is well working and good usability and accessibility nobody will will sort of call you and say wow your service is fantastic but don't be don't be sad about that because we as humans, we don't do this. We complain when we see bad things, but we don't call people and say, wow, what a good service you have, <laughs> which is a pity, but that is the way it is. So if you don't get complaints, that is very positive. And probably your clients will return to you. Your customers will be happy and they will be doing things by themselves. So that is also a way to save money because we have measurements from uh, public authorities and also e-services in, in Scandinavia that we have helped with accessibility and they say they actually save money because they have so many fewer um, questions and complaints and, and problems with users calling in and saying I can't do this, I don't know what, what to do, I, you need to help me. And if that amount of people goes down then you save money because the service staff can work with, with real things instead of small small details. Of course it's also good for the corporate social, social responsibility and some of our clients are talking about having and making a good impression and showing that they are good um, for society and so on. But very many fewer than I thought. When I started at the Funka I thought that would be the largest argument but it hasn't been. When we work with the banks they don't do this to be good guys, they do it to sh earn money. <laughs> they know it's return on investment to work with accessibility and that is even more strong than doing the CSR thing, <coughs> I think. So, this is a very nice illustration that we have got from a person with ADD that we work with. And it's a picture of the brain and somewhere in the middle you see it gets a no sign and, and if you look at it long enough it will actually say yes but it takes a very long time and it's just an, um, uh, a picture of how this person says that this is how I experience when I get information into my brain and I have to get some output out again on the other side and I think it illustrates a little bit how complicated the world has been to us and all the ICT that, we, that are around us and what we really um, what, what we try to make people do. We have so many screens and so many technologies and so many passwords and so many codes and systems and I don't know what that people really need to, to handle in their everyday life otherwise it doesn't work for them. So for me it's not a problem because I have the world's nicest ICT department to ask if I have a problem but for my mother who doesn't have an ICT department she well she calls me which is a bad idea but but then <laughs> but for everyone that is not working in an ICT company or have a large department of technical people we really demand a lot just to to be able to buy a ticket or do anything just a very simple thing today is requires that you interact with some sort of interface and I really think that we need to start a revolution and say hey this is too complicated I need the easy thing I don't I don't want to stand before a parking uh, machine and don't know how to pay I mean that's even if I can read and I can see and I have parked my car before but sometimes they are so extremely difficult that I don't know how to do how to I just quit, I just go away <laughs> and hope that nobody will f uh, give me a fine. I mean that's not, um, and I know it's the same here, uh, I've seen some very complicated things. Sometimes it's difficult just to have a cup of coffee in a coffee machine, I think you have experienced that. So I think if you do interfaces that are easy to use, which means that you work from an accessibility angle and a user experience angle and then I think your products will be much more popular. I think it's very um, easy to see that proven, proven in, in real life. 
and the smartphone uh, did something that is of course much easier than what we are used to do with a computer because really if you think about it having something in your hand and trying to move that and then the arrow points somewhere else it's extremely difficult for your brain and if you see small children having touch screens and they can instantly without any instruction understand how it works so the touch screen is for many users extremely um, much more sort of direct uh, in, in the way uh, that you can learn it. So just some uh, quick examples uh, of where we've seen this really uh, movement happening. We have uh, worked a lot with the Swedish and Norwegian broadcasting companies, um, the public ones and also the private, but the public ones are really better in this. And of course, um, they have a responsibility to be accessible and they also want to be accessible. And really working with multimedia on the web is one of the strongest thing you can do for accessibility. Because normally, uh, even if it's standardization or if it's uh, consultancy work, many people think that accessibility on the web, oh, that's something with blind people. And that's fine, because it is, but that's just a very small part of it. Accessibility has to do so much with cognitive issues and motor uh, impairments and and hearing aids and lots lots of other things and, and learning disabilities is, is a good um, very large thing so i think a little bit of the accessibility world has focused so much on visually impairments so that we have forgotten uh, many other groups and really uh, providing multimedia in an accessible way that is one of the strongest thing you can do and also when you work with pictures and illustrations and film you also um, you can also overcome some of the language barriers because you don't need to maybe understand every word if you can see a very good film or just pictures of how to do something. Then the, the instructions are very much uh, better. And we do also have, I mean, IKEA, Swedish company that you might know of, they would never have succeeded if they would have tried to write down in, in, with uh, letters how to put all this furniture together. They have only uh, pictures of it. I still think it's difficult for me, but <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it's an economic thing. They cannot translate everything with high quality and put it in different boxes and, and put it to all over the world. That would be a, a, a nightmare from, from a logistic point of view. But really, it's, it's much more pedagogically val valid to do it with pictures. So the picture is strong and the web should not be used as... Um, text only, but it should be used for everything it can do, and it can do a lot of other things. It can use sound, it can use pictures and, and video, so just doing the multi-modal thing is, is very important. Of course, we, we also work with the banks, um, and for them, as I mentioned, this is really return on investment. Um, and it's, uh, it's not as, as strange as it sounds, but really People with disabilities and elderly and people with another maternal language um, can be very difficult to handle when they are queuing in, an, in a bank office because that, that's the kind of customer that takes time. So it's difficult to earn money on them if they, uh, if they are queuing up in line and they take a long time to do everything that they need to do. So one of the Swedish banks many years ago decided that we want these customers but we want them to do the self-service online and then we have to provide them with special things that they can use so they have a lot of different ways of doing the communication with the bank uh, so you can choose to have a very large um, thing with, with large buttons or you can have spoken or anything so you can do it in different ways and because one of the banks said we are doing this not to be good guys but we're doing it and we're earning money on it then the other banks followed <laughs> because the banks are a little bit like a family they do the same thing they look very much into each other so the banking sector is, is strong and I know also many of the banks in Spain have been working with accessibility in a good way as well. So I think that is more or less global. Also travel, the travel industry is also extremely important because from an accessibility and user uh, perspective, travel is of course, and mobility is one of the most important thing and really a human right to be able to, to travel around. Um, and it has, of course, a lot to do with the built environment and the physical uh, way you can move around, but also about the services that it is provided to, to people with different disabilities to, to help getting around, orientation help or, 
or taxis or whatever it can be. And also on the web, of course, a way of, of doing payment and, and sales and marketing and that sort of thing that has to be, all of this has to be guided in a good way and with, with uh, lots of, of concern to take into accessibility. And of course, we also work with, with some cultural institutions uh, museums and, and uh, game parks and all of that kind of things. And it's very interesting when they, this kind of institutions do accessibility work because I think all of them return back to us and say now we have more visitors, we have more elderly visitors, we have more visitors with small children, we have, and they see lots of uh, sort of extra surplus um, um, added values to their to their uh, institutions after they have worked with accessibility. So it's really a good return on investment also for them, even if they are mostly in Scandinavia, they are mostly not uh, businesses, they are mostly governmentally owned, but still. So really, um, going from the uh, customer or the client or the end user perspective and making people happy is the good way of doing things, not because you have to, but because it's it's better for everyone and it's always better to have to have friends and people that are happy instead of having very angry people uh, or sad or complicated customers that's always not so nice and <clears throat> i think just some of the success criteria uh, for for um, doing this in a good way is of course first of all awareness we need to to be aware that these problems exist because still it is not uh, or at least normally not uh, taught at university. Accessibility is not normally a part of the of the curriculum, at least not in Scandinavia. And we have are doing a lot of work with this also in the United States, and I know it's the same problem there. So we, we educate people, uh, students that come out of university and they don't know anything about accessibility. So we will just, then we will never sort of move forward. So I think really getting this into the universities on a very broad level is one of the key factors. Uh, and one of the problems is that when we talk about this, we talk in on conferences like this. It's a special conference and it's very nice to see you here, but probably you know most of this already. I don't need to, I am preaching for the choir, that's what we say. So what we really like to do is to do uh, uh, presentations like this in completely other circumstances. To go to conferences where they speak about something else. That's the best thing, because then we can spread the word and spread the awareness to new groups. And that's the, what we need to do, everyone else. Of course, to have really clear requirements based on standards, but really to have requirements are also a key factor to, to succeed. And that is on a sort of country uh, or national um, level and also in, in all the projects. Um, we still see many um, projects that go bad because the requirements, it like it should be accessible or something like that. And it needs to be really detailed. You need to know what you're doing, otherwise the supplier will not provide you with what you wanted. Of course, user testing, that's what we do all, all day. So I think it's extremely important, but it is <laughs> extremely important. And also after doing all of this, you need to control that you actually got the what you needed. If you have put the requirements out, then the supplier should really give you what you what you required, and then you have to control it. If you are not a specialist in accessibility, you need to ha take help from users or from or, or from consultancies to really control that what you have deli got delivered is accessible, because no one can be an expert in everything, and you are probably you think it's very normal to take a designer should be a specialist or the security person should be a specialist but I think also in accessibility you need specialists to do some of the very detailed work and then of course you need to do this again and again and again because accessibility is a moving target and you will never be finished with accessibility you need to sort of keep moving all the time and and put new goals and be creative and, and innovative because you never you can never sort of tick now we work with accessibility for one year and now we can go on to other things that's not going to happen you need to keep on working with it all the time so <clears throat> and of all of these things i think involving the users are the most uh, important and if you cannot afford to uh, buy a consultancy making you the sort of the perfect user test with 100 dif different users with different uh, assistive technology and blah, 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 just do small user tests. Do it yourself if you need to, but do user test something. And don't do it with a person sitting next to you, but 
at least go out on the street and pick somebody <laughs> because otherwise you will not get a sort of a real uh, result and and you can learn uh, easily to do um, more of the uh, the anal analysis of the testing as well, but really, please, please do user testing. Ask the users because they know much more about this than you, and they have a completely different perspective. So you have to live accessibility. It can sort of never be uh, a theoretical exercise. It, need, it needs to be tested in real life. So um, I don't really know what the future will bring on you more than I'm sure it will be more regulations and more legislation and all these boring things. But I, I hope you will um, try to, to keep the creative, innovative part of, of this and try to do things. And do not, do not be shy, do not be uh, afraid of accessibility. Try things. Fail, 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 fail. Keep on failing, but try to do something else. Mm -hmm. You need to, to have the courage to, <clears throat> to fail and to try. <coughs> Sorry. Because then sometimes somebody will succeed. If we just do the things that we did last time, we will never move on. And we need new ideas and new solutions and things that, that are really getting better. So I'm on overtime, I think, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna, for many things. First of all, for your Spanish. I, I didn't know it was as good as it is. Fantastico. And, um, and for your speech, of course, it's as, as, as usual, it was a pleasure and an honor to have you here, concentrating all these kind of uh, things about accessibility that is really, as, as we said in this conference, that the name of the conference stands for Social Technological Responsibility, in fact. Uh, it has been a, 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 a good way of starting the, this, this session, this, uh, this issue this morning. Um, talking about accessibility as the pillar of everything, probably. Even if we, as users or as persons that don't uh, notice the accessibility in the, in the products. Uh, so it's time for questions. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for your speech. It has been very positive and thank you so much. And the question is uh, about the standards. In Europe, I think the standards are complicated. So what do you think about the 508 section in North America? Is that a model uh, for you? Is that a good practice that in Europe is not so clear, not so easy as we have in North America? What, what is your thinking on that? That's a very interesting question. <clears throat> I think... Oh. <laughs> Everything is breaking down. It's not, at least it's not me. I'm very happy. So, um, so it's a very interesting question. I think to me, uh, well, you are of course aware of that they are now reworking also the 508, so we, we don't really know where that is going. But, but I think the legislation in the US is really something like the forerunner for most of the accessibility legislation and of course everyone is looking into that and I think it has some very good and interesting parts but being in the United States now I'm more and more there and we have clients there as well I'm in complete shock every time because all accessibility work is sort of directed by legislators and lawyers and it's so much about um, are we going to go to jail or not but that is the culture of the United States, and not that is not the sort of uh, it's not the fault of of uh, the Section 508. I think the legislation is good, and I think we need something like that in Europe if we are going to move forward in the um, human rights uh, part of of these things. Absolutely, um, but I also think that it's important that we don't end up where the United States are right now, because. I, all, all our colleagues in the ICT uh, uh, companies over there, they say that the only reason that people work with accessibility is not to go to jail. So they ask exactly what do we have to do and then they don't do anything more. And that's the, really my, my fear about legislation and standardization and everything is that to me it's a question of a tool. 
it's the baseline, it's a tool that you uh, use to create something, but if you communicate that in a wrong way, the, the users of the standard or the people that are going to comply to the legislation, they think that the standard is the goal. And that is the real problem. I have the same problem with, with WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. For us, that is 15% or what we do when we do accessibility requirements. 15% is the WCAG and the rest is not covered in WCAG. But the WCAG is important, of course. Uh, but when people think that if we comply with WCAG, it's accessible, then it's completely mixed up. So it's a difficult, um, there's many layers of structure here and the communication of how you use the standard, I think is, is uh, the most important thing. But I. Personally, I believe that the EN 301549 will be a, a huge leap forward. That's a stand, European standard for, um, for um, procurement of, of accessibility in procurement of ICT. And when that takes, um, makes, well, when it's known <laughs> and started to get used and it will be led, like the legislation in, in all the member states, then I think it will really help for procurement is not everything, but it's a key factor to help moving things forward. So I think we are step by step, we are going in the right direction, but it's a fragmented market and it's difficult to see exactly how to do this. And well, the system of providing assistive technology is so different in different parts of Europe. So yeah, coming from the Scandinavian perspective, we believe that some of the, like the web directive and the standards and so on, they are um, they are a little bit lagging behind because we have moved beyond that already. So we have a problem when we are going to do things together in Europe that we have Bulgaria, Greece, some countries with really low accessibility and they of course need to be lifted up. But in the same time, if you have a standard and everything is pointing to that standard and if the societies think that that is the goal, then the Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Finnish, they will just fall asleep and do nothing. And that is what we need to, that's why we don't really, I mean the standard is the baseline, but you need to do much more. That's the, yeah, so, a long, long and complicated answer. Uh, it's a very good question. Yeah. Mm. And, and anyway, I, my anecdote on this is that uh, I, I, I met, as uh, we both are users of Apple, and, and you, you have talked about it, and, and it's fantastic for accessibility, at least for blind persons or so. My anecdote is I met, um, I met Steve Jobs, three times in my life, one minute each, not just one minute each, but the first time was in, in, the, in San Francisco, probably by uh, 1980 something, and I wanted to use a Mac, and I said, well, uh, hey, um, Steve, I'm, I'm blind, and I, I would like to use a Mac, and he told me, we don't work for charity. <laughs> that was the first time. The second one was about uh, 1995 or something, uh, one, one more time in San Francisco and I asked the same question. I'd like to use your products and so. And he told me, we are probably thinking about working on that or something like this. But after the 508, I met him last time in 97 and they were, they, they were starting uh, working on the, on the voiceover and this kind of thing. So I don't know, the Saxon way of uh, legislation is sometimes not, uh, is, we have not the same character in Europe, probably, but uh, yeah, this kind of legislat legislation is important. In, in fact, my question for you would be, uh, do you think we need or, or we, have, uh, we are prepared in Europe to have an ADA or something like that over the, the rest of legislation or particular local legislations? I think it's important that we try to do something uh, in Europe and and I think since well, for as I think for the most of my life, it has been discussed uh, ADA in Europe. So, <laughs> so but also um, as long as I can remember, we have discussed uh, to have the lack of accessibility as a discrimination, uh, as a point of discrimination in Sweden. And I have betted several hundred euros on that it would never happen because it has been discussed forever and 
this January it happened, so I lost a lot of money and I'm happy. So maybe it, the ADA in, in Europe will come, I don't know, I'm not betting on that, but I hope, I hope it will and I mean the work is, is being done. It's, um, we need it, uh, I'm sure we need it and uh, probably sometime, someday it will, it will happen, I think so. Yeah, More questions? Okay. Yes, please. Um, thanks for the presentation. My question is the following. Um, uh, imagine um, Sweden uh, without any uh, laws, rules, legislations, uh, standards, and so on connected um, with accessibility. Um, how different uh, would the country and the population uh, could be? Uh, in other words, um, um, how much do you need the legislation and the standards and these legal obligations to become an accessible country in your own country? I think that is very different in different cultures. We made a couple of years ago a research study for the European Commission where we measured e-accessibility in all member states. And um, the UK is the winner in all of this and also we, we measured the United States, Canada, Australia and, and Norway as well uh, for benchmark. But Sweden is a, among the top five and we at that time we had no legislation at all. So I think for and we also made some very uh, some other very interesting uh, finds in this research and it's free you can download it from our website or I can send it to you this the summary is short and easy to read and then it's a long boring report as well but but some of the interesting things are really that we found that we need four pillars on a national level to to have uh, a success in ICT accessibility that is a legislation that is not too detailed. It should be a rights uh, legislation, but it shouldn't point to specific details in technique because they are very soon outdated. So legislation, and then you need a work, well-working market. I mean, some places they have, in theory, very good legislation. For example, France has a legislation that in paper looks good, but they don't control it and they don't have a market. So they are not proceeding very well at least, um, anyway. So the legislation as such doesn't help if you don't have uh, a market that can take care of the work. I mean you have to have suppliers that have the knowledge and then you also have to have some good policy work because people need to know why they are doing this and I think that's the trick in Sweden. We don't have the legislation but people know that people that are uh, responsible for websites they still know that this is a good thing to do and it has to do with policy work. And then the fourth pillar is, of course, the end-user organizations. They need to be strong and vocal, and they need to know about uh, e-accessibility, because in some countries, the, the end-user organizations are very good in the built environment. They know a lot there. They have good knowledge, but sometimes they, they lack a little bit of the knowledge of the ICT, because that is such a fast-moving um, sector. So, But with all of these four, then that is sort of the recipe for, for success. So I think that um without i mean without any legislation it would probably be chaos <laughs> traffic jams and all, all sorts of things but but i think that uh, you need to put the legislation in both a cultural uh, context and also in 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 a context of of uh, different sectors the the academies needs to innovate and be creative. The companies need to take their responsibility, the end user organization. So this all pillars of, of the society needs to work together. And then I think it can really be an accessible world. But just legislation as such, we actually proved in that, that research that doesn't help, or it helps maybe, but it's not the solution of it. So I think you need, you need to do many things. You need to work in, in many different areas. And we, well, we try to be all over the place. So that's, we need help. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's also why we um, why we founded this um, association of accessibility professionals because we see there is a racing demand, but really we need to be more specialists in accessibility and to to be able to to help this. Great. It it was not prepared, Susanna, but uh, the 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 first two questions came from members of our patronate. So <laughs> anyway, any other question outside the FTS? <laughs> I hope I hope my, my English uh, it's quite good. Um, 
even when you're an uh, iPhone user, uh, for example, last uh, Android version, uh, Lollipop, is well known uh, due to its uh, accessibility uh, features. Um, which uh, tech mayor do you think is uh, doing things really well? Um, especially w since we know that uh, Steve Jobs uh, didn't work for charity. Which large company in technology do you think are, are doing things really well in, in terms of uh, accessibility? Oh, that's quite difficult. Um, we uh, normally we 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 don't like that kind of questions because we not like to be or believe that we are very objective. But but I think many of the larger corporations are doing a lot of good things. But that doesn't mean that it's perfect. I mean, Microsoft is doing a lot of things in accessibility, but we all hate Microsoft, right? So, um, but they they actually do a lot of good things, and they have highly prof skilled professionals working with accessibility, and they do take it very seriously. Not because they have to, because they want to. But still, we can never work with SharePoint because it is completely useless from an accessibility point of view. But some of the things they do, they are really trying. And IBM also has a very serious accessibility work. So I think some of the larger, or many of the large corporations are, are doing a lot of good things in accessibility. But it's, it's hard to change everything very, very fast. And money talks so you need to have more business cases you need to prove the you, prove the case for that you can really earn money on accessibility i think that's a key factor to make the sort of the industry move um, in a better direction but i mean if you look at both ibm and adobe microsoft all of these big guys they have been living under the 508 <clears throat> for many years and still their products is, are not perfect so that's also a proof that legislation is not the answer <coughs> And we also see some small companies doing very good things. The problem is that it's difficult to sort of survive <coughs> in in the technology era. Um, most most small companies sooner or later are bought by the by the bigger ones, and then the, all these good things that they were, did in usability and accessibility that sort of dilutes into to normal things. But Google is also doing lots of good things for accessibility, really. PayPal has been very good. eBay now has a new accessibility director that is really uh, interesting, I think. So I would say many of the of the larger corporations are really doing good things. And I'm sure there are examples from Spain as well that I don't know of. But but I'm sure there are. So the hmm. applications in fact are day by day more accessible than the websites, of course. But then once again uh, thank you very much for being here with us for this uh, fantastic uh, speech and uh, we just need some photos and some coffee and, uh, and the rest of the session continues on. Thank you all. Thank you.